It's that time of the week again and we're back as always with an engaging episode of your favorite show Colors of India. Welcome, first a quick look at what is in store. It's the Trilokim Festival. Facts are stranger than fiction. And let's dine on Middle Eastern treats. The world of dance, music and literature were fused together into one universe at the Trilokim Festival. Let's take a look. The Trilokim Festival tops the list of must attends in Delhi's cultural calendar. The event kick-started at Kamani Auditorium with a Kuchipuri dance recital by the organizers of this festival, Natya Tarangini School of Dance. History tells us that Kuchipudi is originally a dance ballet and Natya Tarangini was able to reproduce this group art form in all its forgotten glory. Every dancer in the group was an epitome of unbound energy and intense involvement. But it was when the gurus took to stage that the scene changed for the better. Radharaja Reddy's repertoire portrayed the masculine vigour and lyrical charm of this classical dance form. Without sacrificing the dramatic sensibility or poetry in this art, their choreographies left everyone mesmerised. The highlight of the evening was when the duo got around to interpreting the fundamental concept of dance, the Navarasas. Together with their students, they were able to keep the audience glued to their seats throughout the show. After that stunning show, it's time to move onwards to something else. Ruma Sharma's painting exhibition brought to life the story of the female 
only from another perspective. In its initiative to bring forth hidden talent, the ICCR inaugurated an exhibition of paintings by Roma Sharma, an artist who has developed her own artistic sensibilities and chooses women as her muse. Her exhibition titled Journey Through Womanhood is a visual whisper of the many lives a woman lives in a single lifetime. In our own uh, uh, Indian philosophy, uh, in, in the Purans and the Upanishads, the woman has a very high status in the society. In fact, the woman is the carrier of the universe with the womb. She is the one who produces. So, she's, so in that sense, as a Devi, as a Shakti, she has a very high status. Her paintings portray the relationship between the animate and the inanimate. Taking inspiration from everyday life, she focuses on the eternal wonders of a woman who aspires to be sensitive as well as assertive. Through her paintings, she portrays the different emotions that she herself has faced. Women are every aspect of life. No? They are working. They are uh, working as a housewife also. They are the homemakers. They are going out, working in the society for society upliftment of society. So they were everywhere. Ruma uses oil on canvas as the medium for her art. Some of her paintings are part contemporary with an emphasis on the blue tone which gives it a dreamy appearance. She has also done work with pen and ink with details that stress her deep thoughts. But she prefers to leave them untitled, letting the viewer decipher them on their own. The maturity of a canvas or a painting comes if it is properly divided, the space, given space is properly divided and the volumes which has been built there as a figure or animal that stands up at his own rather than supporting or falling on each other, it should individually stand at its own. Ruma places her subjects in dramatic situations, giving her work a surrealistic approach. The deep aspirations of a woman were painted onto a canvas. Surely that is why it was so relatable. It is now time for another break, but we won't be gone for too long. Coming up, the tale of the exiled king and Delhi's version of the Shavarma.
Welcome back. Have you ever read a book by a first time author and wondered what took this person so long to pick up the pen? It happened to me just the other day. Published by HarperCollins, The King in Exile, written by Sudar Shah, is a work of non-fiction that well documents the life of the last Burmese king and his family. <laughs> Sudar is a finance analyst turned writer and this is her first published work. When I read Amitav Ghosh's Glass Palace, I was so taken in with the story and fascinated by it that I was curious as to what happened next. And uh, since nothing had been written about it, um, I just started researching it on my own, but in the beginning not with the objective of writing a book, but just for my own curiosity. And one thing led to the other. and. Um, became a book. I think what my challenge was is that the, there were a variety of sources, archival material, interviews with people, newspaper accounts, magazine accounts, books, etc, um, etc. Et so for me to, um, it was like, you know, weaving it into a story. I wanted a strong storyline. It's not a book on history. It's um, a, um, a human interest story. So to do that was what was the challenge. It's all um, based on facts. I think uh, it was such a strange story that I could not have made up a work of fiction uh, stranger than it. At the launch, Sudha was in conversation with journalist and columnist Sunil Sethi and she shared personal experiences and photographs from her research work. The first part of the book speaks in detail about the all-powerful life of royalty in Burma, disclosing the lavish setting in which they thrived. I began reading it and I really was quite fascinated. I, uh, um, it's a story that's simultaneously a very interesting political story and it's very uh, human as well and it's very, very well researched. So it's simultaneously what you could say scholarly and chatpata at the same time. It's, it's a great pleasure to read it. I've only got, read uh, the first third of the book. Certainly it's very well written. The second part of the text is about living in exile in India and the trials and tribulations the family had to go through, while the last part focuses on the present day life of the royal descendants. The King in Exile is a human interest story of this forgotten but fascinating family. A thoroughly researched piece of non-fiction and the birth of it, a story stranger than a work of fiction. Now how about something musical for a change? Wajid Ali Shah, the ruler of Avad, and Sadiq Ali Khan, a prominent musician from the family of Kaval Bache, are known for the role they played in developing the Tumri genre. Keeping the legacy alive, Malini Avasti ended the two-day Thumri festival on a high note.
परफॉर्मिंग आर्ट आला दर्जे की ऑडियंस हो और ऐसा मौसम मानसून का ये भी वर्षा का मौसम है तो तो गाने बजाने का मौसम वैसे ही है तो ये एक मुझे लगता है सोने पे सुहागा है कि टाइमिंग इतनी परफेक्ट है लोग फेस्टिवल के टाइमिंग्स कहते हैं अक्टूबर नवंबर दिसंबर लेकिन ये महीना एक ऐसा है दो तीन महीने से कि इसमें अंदर से प्रेरणा जगती है गाने की To bring out the most of this genre, she started off with a kamaj and tumri rendition. The kamaj is one of the ten rhythms of Hindustani classical music, and Malini Avasti performed in the most traditional manner. सबसे सुनने में जितनी अच्छी जितनी दिल को छूती हुई सरल लगती है सबसे मुश्किल गाना ठुमरी है सबसे कठिन क्योंकि एक ऐसा कलाकार को संतुलन रखना पड़ता है गायकी का और भाव अभिव्यक्ति का जो व्यक्ति शास्त्रीय संगीत में निपुण हो क्योंकि इसमें राग की रंजकता बढ़ाने के लिए राग बदलते भी हैं ऐसे बदलते हैं कि कभी लगे ना कि बदला गया है कैसे खेलन सावन नेक्स्ट शी ऑल्सो यूज दो हज इन सिंगिंग खजरी This style infused with tumri is generally sung during the monsoon period. It is the story of a lady worried about her lover as dark clouds come drifting in. Ha Bhauji boli ai sun bolli Are sun ke ji aap lag jaise boli Bhauji boli ai sun boli sun ke ji aap lag boli kitne taakat hui hai They are mostly based on Radha and Krishna's love lo. On popular demand, she sang the famous Tumri composition Kachori Gali. As the music soared high, so did the applause of her listeners. <laughs> When there are not enough words to express oneself that's when music takes over. Float with these tunes for a while longer while we take in a small break. Coming up next, the Middle Eastern midday meal.
Welcome back. It's time for the delicious, the divine and the sinful. Let's go on the food trail. I'll bake a new friend's colony, a name that is equal to the dish that they serve. The yummy, yummy shawarmas. In the international arena, there is this chest-thumping cultural war about the origins of this dish. Turkey, Abu Dhabi, Syria and Lebanon all claim to be the creators. But in Delhi, shawarma means albeik and since the year 2000, they have been rolling this out for Delhi's hungry hands. My parents were in the Gulf, in Saudi Arabia. And there was a daily use to eat shawarma daily. And when they came back to the Gulf, they thought that this is such a good dish. And we eat it every day and every day we will eat it. तो ना आखिर में ये सोचा क्यों ना ये इतनी अच्छी चीज़ मैं अपनी दिल्ली वालों के लिए भी ले चलूं और फिर वो स्टार्ट हुए और फिर खास तौर पे उन्होंने ये सोचा कि जो लो बजट और स्टूडेंट लोग हैं और नॉनवेज खाना चाहते हैं साफ़ सुथरा और आइजीनिक नॉनवेज खाना चाहते हैं तो ये उन स्पेशली उनके लिए ले गए और बजाय लोगों को टेस्ट वहाँ का देने का और यहाँ के टेस्ट के हिसाब से हमने इसको डेवलप करके शॉर्मा स्टार्ट किया The story of the shawarma is a country-by-country country experience changing in taste and textures. When it came to Delhi, it is sometimes known as the shawarma and it is served here with mint chutney. But apart from this regionalization, the making of the shawarma or the shawarma is a technique unchanged. Meat is grilled on a rotisserie for several hours, allowing it to cook in its own juices. And each time there is an order, it is shaved off, minced and rolled inside flat bread and served with garlic flavoured mayonnaise. Mm. Now the flavours have come together beautifully and even with them being a little familiar, the taste is definitely Middle Eastern. to be careful about eating it because they fall from the other side. Also on top of their list is the roasted chicken. Big fat pieces of semi-marinated chicken decorate the glass case at Al -Bay. This then finds its way into the hot tandoor before it is plated up. Roasted chicken, India's favourite finger food. So this here is served with a very, very spicy mint and green chilli chutney. Of course, there are onions and uh, lemons if you want to use them. But I believe that something like this should not get diluted by mixing with extra things. Just have them the way it is. The menu is rather diverse here. al -Bake has within its folds Punjabi delicacies, Chinese items and other Delhi favourites like the sheik kebab and the chicken momo. It is also a tradition to finish off a meal at Albaik 
and order the lemon tea at the shop next door. Well, after all that food here, I could hardly move a muscle, which is why I've got some lemon tea from Javed Bhai's shop, which is just next to this one. That's good. Now I do hope the rest of you can fathom enough strength to go and grab your smartphones and send us your suggestions and feedbacks onto our Facebook page. I will see you next week. Until then, take care and bye.